It's the early hours of the 29th of August 2024, UK time. And as it stands, we're just over eight weeks away from the US election. Um, I've just been looking over some of the covers, the newspaper covers from January the, well, it was published on January the 7th, but the events of January the 6th, 2021. Um, and it just reiterates why Donald Trump's utterly unfit for office. Uh, what's significant here is, is this is both left and right. Daily Star. Kind of their typical flippant cover. Um, but more serious papers as well. The Eye. Times. The Daily Mail. And the eye again. Now, when presidents' legacies are assessed, there's, there's a lot of things that happen in presidencies. But this is going to be Trump's legacy. And it's um, disgraceful. You know, the idea that that man could theoretically be back in the White House, I find Utterly staggering. Utterly staggering. Now, um, the 2020 election wasn't close. Biden got a comfortable victory. He won the Electoral College and the popular vote. But it's worth looking at some historic comparisons of closely fought elections. 2000, you know, Al Gore um, lost the Supreme, Supreme Court ruling on that. Um, he didn't uh, concede until I think it was several weeks afterwards. And of course, back then, there would have been anger, there would have been tensions, but Gore's supporters never resorted to um, violence. Angry, anger, sure, I'm sure there was a lot of shouting matches, but it never resorted to outright violence on the US Capitol. Um, the election of, I believe it was 1876, between Rutherford B. Hayes and Samuel Tilden, if I've got that right, um, there was a series of elections in that era 1876, 1880, and 1884 that were all very close. I think it was the one between Hayes and Tilden, I think, if my history is correct, 1876. But regardless, um, it, it was pretty serious, and there was even talk of a second civil war, which never transpired because federal troops were sent in uh, to secure the situation. And yet here we are in the third decade of the 21st century, and you had violence in the U.S. Capitol. Now, I, I think the importance of this can't be understated because since that happened, conservatives and um, not just Republicans, but conservatives elsewhere have tried to downplay it and say, oh, it's just a riot that got out of hand. Um, I, I think that is astonishingly um, naive or willfully ignoring the implications of that. What you had was a failed candidate who lost the election who would not concede defeat, who implicitly um, incited the violence by pushing conspiracy theories, by goading the rioters. He didn't directly say, go out and attack the Capitol. But it really, you know, anyone who looks at the sort of statements that Trump made and the approach that he took and wants to argue with a straight face that he had no culpability for what happened is, is deluded, frankly. Um, it's plain for everyone to see. Um, disgracefully, Trump was still president at that point. It was before Inauguration Day. Disgracefully, Trump done nothing, nothing to stop those people. An absolute and utter disgrace that just shouldn't disqualify him forever. And as far as I'm concerned, he should be in prison for that. Um, disgraceful. I find it astonishing, though, that a lot of his hardcore supporters are so zealous about the Constitution when Donald Trump has basically, um, I don't want to be crude here, but he has basically, I'll, I'll be polite about it, he has trashed the Constitution. Um, in terms of his dereliction of duty, in terms of inciting a direct attack on the US Capitol. Uh, there's a lot of debate over what that day should be called. Uh, a riot that got out of hand, an attempted coup, an insurrection. Um, and it is quite difficult to pinpoint. Because it wasn't a coup in a traditional sense where you would have like renegade generals or something like that. Um, 
was it organised? I I don't think it was a riot that got out of hand. I think that when you look at the likes of the Oath Keepers, there was definitely some degree of planning involved. Um, even, you know, the, the evidence that there was people in law enforcement that were members of some of those extremist groups. So I, I don't think it should be totally dismissed that there was some organisation involved. Um, when you consider the Republicans who were on the committee into that, and Republicans who accepted Biden's victory, became hate figures they were deemed to be traitors, then it truly shows how toxic the Trump of cult is. Um, the, excuse me, the cult of Trump. Um, disgraceful. Um, in fact, that Republican senator who spoke at the Democratic National Convention was one of those who was targeted. Um, Mr. Kissinger, I think his name was. Um, Mike Pence, of course. And Mike Pence is hardly a moderate Republican. You know, he was a pretty red conservative. And he was a Trump acolyte right up until the last minute. He'd finally done the decent thing, but he paid for it with threats to his life. Um, I'd say it was the one decent thing Mike Pence done. I think, you know, being attached to Trump as closely as he was for that long um, is also part of Pence's legacy, but he done the decent thing in the end. Um... But I want to talk here about something specific about MAGA zealots. Now, I know people are going to jump at me, or jump on me for this and say, oh, Nathan, you're vilifying everyone who supports Trump. You're vilifying all Trump supporters. No, actually, I'm not. And it's, you know, this is the sort of reactionary attitude that people have. I'm talking about extremists. I'm not talking about everyone who supports Trump. I think they're very wrong, and I think they're very misguided to support Trump. But I don't think they're all bad people. Um, but I do think there is a dangerous contingent part of Trumpism. I do think that there is um, an extremist underbelly there. Unquestionably, there's far-right components, um, neo-Nazi components to a lesser extent. But it's not necessarily the race thing. This Trump has minority supporters, that has to be acknowledged. It's more people who have gone so far down the rabbit hole that they difficult to see them getting out of it. I'll give you an example. I've quoted this before. The, um, actually, I don't think it was a BBC journalist, I think ITV journalist. Um, but she was interviewing people at, a, at an event in Illinois. It wasn't a political rally. It was some sort of cultural thing. But the, the mindset of the last guy that she interviewed, he said, there'll be a revolution if Trump loses. And bear in mind, Trump himself said, there'll be bloodshed if I if I lose, um, and this was before the assassination attempt. Um, you know, this guy said there'll be a revolution, and we've got more firearms than the military, I think he said. It was, you know, you could see the intensity of his um, stance, and um, it's a holy war. That's how this guy saw it. And ironically, he had a shirt emblazoned with passages from the Constitution, I mean, I'm thinking, does this does this guy seriously think Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, the founding fathers would in any way, shape or form be endorsing Donald Trump? It, it just, so I look at that and I think people like that cannot be dismissed. You know, it's easy to laugh at them, but they they do have firearms and they are, I think they'd be capable of using them in a violent sense. Now, what that guy said was an implicit threat of violence. If Trump loses, we've got more firearms than the military. I mean, and you can see the paranoia sinking in, you know, I'm not going to be sent to the re-education camps. Um, so it's easy to dismiss these people, but I think they're very real. Now, I've long considered that when it comes to any form of extremism, whether it be far right, far left, Islamist, Early intervention is, is possible and it is important. Um, I don't think we should just sink to this dystopian conclusion. Nothing can be done. I, I'm certainly in favour of reasonable intervention measures, um, getting young people away from toxic websites, for example. But I do think when someone has gone to that point, I, I don't see how you could get through to them. I think you get occasionally get people who re sort of reform, they see the light. But I look at someone like that and I think, 
I mean, the journalist said, you know, that what you're saying is quite scary. And he said, well, you have to understand it's holy war with a straight face on camera. And we're not talking about a few hundred people here. There will be potentially, I wouldn't like to put a figure on it, but I don't think they're just a, a few hundred people. I think they actually go into quite a significant number. Like I said, I wouldn't want to put a figure on it. I have no idea. But I think there's a lot of them. So you get Trump supporters who genuinely think he was a good president. They agree with his policies. And, you know, that's a right. Although I think they're incredibly misguided. And I would urge them to consider that this is a man who is an indicted felon. Now, you might think that's been engineered by the Democrats. Um, you might dislike the Democrats because of the record and border security. I would just point out that the Democrats tried to get a bipartisan bill for border security, which Trump stood against, you know, because he thought that getting something done about it, because it was a bipartisan bill, would make him look bad. Um, so he threatened to shut down the government instead. Um, but, you know, clearly I'm not going to see eye to eye with Trump supporters. That's, that's beside the point. I'll still be generous enough to say I don't think that they're all violent extremists. I don't believe that. In the same way that I don't believe all reform forwards are racists. Certainly not. The majority are probably not. But some certainly are. And likewise, there are unquestionably Trump supporters who are absolutely um, dangerous individuals. We're talking about oath keepers. We're talking about militia types. I honestly believe that there is other Timothy McVeigh types lurking out in America right now, I was going to cite some, you know, Kansas, but it, frankly, it could be anywhere. It could be New Jersey, it could be New York. I don't even think it's a red state versus blue state thing. I think these people could be found probably in California and New York. I don't think it's restricted to red states. Um, and it's scary. But, you know, the long standing convention is. Um, and politics and this is something the Democrats push we need to be unified we need to reach out and of course that's very very important I support that but I, I do draw a line in so far as being overly civil to people who frankly don't deserve it I mean let me give an example if you have parents who'd lost their child to gun violence and they saw Trump and other Republicans doing not a damn thing about that and then they see fanatics like Alex Jones pushing the whole Sandy Hook thing. Um, I don't know if Jones is a Trump supporter or not. Trump's probably too moderate for him. But anyway, um, the point I'm making here is a lot of Trump supporters have very similar mindset. So I think it's unreasonable to expect people who've went through that sort of experience to just reach out and try and understand Trump supporters. I don't think people who have a contempt for democracy, who will not accept the results of a democratic election, should kind of, they, I don't think they deserve excessive etiquette put it that way. Um, because Trump is poisonous, he is the cult leader. But, you know, the thing is, it isn't just ignorant people who support him. What concerns me, I've seen a lot of intelligent people support him. And for those people, the only conclusion I can draw is they are, their moral compass is seriously skewed because these are educated people. They can articulate a decent argument. They, um, they're they clearly not living in the backwoods, you know, um, yet they still serve as cheerleaders for Donald Trump. I find that rather hard to stomach and I find it rather hard to fathom. And I can't help but think their moral compass is skewed. Um, you know, to know everything that man has done and still basically defend him, it's disgraceful. Um, so I know this isn't a particularly hopeful video, but it's just my honest observations. I'm not convinced that MAGA extremists can be compromised with. I'm not convinced that they can be reasoned with. I'd like to be optimistic and say they could. And, you know, I've seen people who have been members of extremist groups see the error of the ways, find the light and kind of get back to sanity. But I think, for example, the Oath Keepers, I remember seeing a video about a young man and his mother who escaped the home because 
the guy's father was an oath keeper and you know a fanatical Trump supporter. He was stalking his aunt, and the, the guy described him his father as a psychological terrorist. That's the words he used. I mean, I can imagine living with someone like this uh, when you don't agree with them must be an absolute surreal thing. Um, and the thing is, I think, you know, I can picture the situation where you try to reason with them, you try to find common ground, but then, you know, unless you see the world exactly the way they do, it's, I mean, frankly, you'd be putting your safety at risk when you consider that they've got firearms. It just, you know, consider the group that tried to cut, kidnap Gretchen Whitmer. Now, I can already predict some of the responses here. People will be pointing out extremes on the left. Well, I've always called out all extremes, and I'm aware that there's extremes on the left. For example, I do not trust Antifa. Uh, they claim that they're anti-fascist, but, you know, they're violent. Uh, Black Lives Matter absolutely has racist components. I think it's become a rather toxic movement. I think it's far more divisive than constructive, although I think they started off with valid concerns about police brutality. Um, but Black Lives Matter, you know, a lot of their leaders were anti-white racists. That's not going to unify America. And I think that the Democrats should distance themselves from some of that sort of rhetoric, for sure. Uh, when the George Floyd riots were going on, you know, shocking, terrible. People's businesses destroyed, over 30 people killed. It was actually bloodier than what happened on January 6th. And that shouldn't be forgotten. And whilst Joe Biden condemned the violence and said criminals should be arrested, Nancy Pelosi cannot play squeaky clean with this. Um, some of her statements could be regarded as incitement. Um, so politicians across the board need to be very careful what they say. There's one thing, it's one thing being passionate and one thing advocating support, one thing being strongly opinionated, but I think politicians need to be responsible and must be absolutely crystal clear that they, you know, violence cannot be normalised. Um, but it, it scares me, quite honestly, and I'm not even in the United States. I think that there is a, there's a mindset out there, um, and we could maybe draw an equivalent here with the recent violence we've seen in the UK, um, you know, and the cult leaders in our case is the likes of Tommy Robinson. Although it's, I don't think it's on the same scale as Trumpism, but it's bad enough. Um, and it, it's the same thing, you know, it's this deflectionism. So you'll get people who will condemn the violence, but they'll try and find, you know, they'll then go on to basically excuse it. It's pathetic. Um, I think all the signs are Trump's probably going to lose this election, but what does that mean? Does it mean I don't think I don't think we're going to see a repeat of what happened on that day in 2021 because security is going to be very heavy. I just don't think it'll happen again in that way. But I think that violence can manifest in some other way. I think you know I hope that Harris and Walt have very good security. Um, and you know violence can work both ways. Donald Trump was a victim of uh, violence. I condemn it. I would say he's incited a lot of it. He's definitely, you know, in no position to lecture about excitement. But we, we can't normalise political violence even against Trump. It's, it's wrong. And it's, you know, it doesn't help anything. Um, Trump shouldn't be shot. He should be in prison. That's how I feel about it. Among other things, aside from it being wrong, um, you know, it only would serve to martyrise him if he died that day. You know, thankfully that didn't happen. But if he did... He would have been martyrized. And then what? All that will do is increase, you know, turn him into a heroic figure. The Democrats, of course, would formally condemn it. There'd be like a state funeral or something. But I, I, I don't know. It is incredible, actually. There wasn't violence after that attempted assassination by the MAGA people. But I'm not, I, I don't think that can be held up as, oh, look, they're not that extreme after all. Because they've shown plenty of examples that they are. The plot to kidnap Gretchen Whitmer, the events of January the 6th. Um, so I, I don't think you could just say, oh, well, look, the candidate was almost assassinated and Trump supporters didn't react with violence. Well, you know, good for them. But that doesn't wipe the slate clean of everything else that's happened.
anyway, I'm going to wrap this up. But I, I really think it's unreasonable to say to moderate Americans, oh, you need to reach out to these people and you need to get an embassy tonight. I think that there may be some cases where there could be sort of common ground. People could say, look, um, I don't agree with everything the Democrats stand for. I don't like critical race theory. I'm a gun owner, etc., etc. But I think when people cannot bring themselves to accept democracy, how do you how do you reason with that mindset? How do you reason with a mindset that will not just accept the obvious? And they go down a rabbit hole. I, I don't know how you bring people out of a rabbit hole. I'm not that smart. I don't know how you do that. So that's my thoughts on it. And it's why, um, although I'm optimistic about Paris and the Democrats at the moment to some extent, I am also very concerned. Um, and you might think, well, Nathan, it's America, it's another country, but it, why does this matter? It matters because America is the most powerful country in the world. America's direction matters. And I think America in chaos is not good for the West. By extension, that's, yeah, it's just not a good direction at all. Um, I don't think in Europe we should gloat about that. I think it would be very damaging for the world. Could even have economic consequences, I don't know. But um, I, I just don't see how mag extremists can be compromised with. And I think certainly when they cross a line, they should be treated as, as criminals. You know, if there is, um, if they're engaging in law breaking, they should be arrested. Absolutely. And, you know, anyone who's still in doubt about Trump, consider the fact that he is going to pardon these people. Consider the fact that he essentially praises them. That is an absolute disgrace. And if that doesn't wake people up to what Trump is all about, then I don't know what will. Um... So yeah, I uh, I've criticised Trump and Trumpism, but the extension of this is that I think there is a fanatical support base there that are very capable of violence, and I think it's unreasonable to expect moderate Americans, whether they be Democrat or Republican, to find reason with these people. I think they should be held to account when they cross the line; they should be arrested. And as for the freedom of speech argument. That ends when you uh, take away the rights of others by inciting violence against them. Something that Elon Musk doesn't seem to care about. Um, the fact that Musk is endorsing Trump says it all. I do question the moral compass of anyone who endorses Trump at this point. I'm not saying they have to support Harris, but I, I genuinely question the moral compass of anyone supporting Donald Trump enthusiastically in August 2024. You know, I would even be okay with people who want to concede because they don't, I mean, um, not vote because they don't want to support Harris and the Democrats, fine. But to endorse Trump, I, I seriously question that. With everything that has happened, I just don't see how any intelligent person can do that in good conscience. Even if they agree with a lot of the things done in this presidency, surely there's, there's a... Surely character has to matter. Surely personal integrity has to matter. Surely um, respecting democracy has to matter. So if you're disregarding all of those things and you want to say, oh, well, Trump was good with border security, Trump was good with um, standing up to woke ideology, etc. Okay, but you're ignoring everything else. I, I just don't think it's like it balances it out. I think Trump's beyond the pale, I really do. Um, you know, I've heard people who are pretty right wing and they say they, they recognize that Trump's a liability and they say things like they'd rather have Ron DeSantis or someone like that. Again, I'd strongly disagree with them, but at least they recognize that Trump's a liability. At least they see it for what it is. 